Well, hello and welcome to Friday, October 23rd, 2020. I am the host, Dale Delbridge, with your numbers for today's status chat. Now, before we get into that, I do want to say that recently, as of this week, I saw some comments online, some frustration, some of the, which uh, is one of the reasons why I, I use these, when I chose these initial numbers. They're quick, they're easy, they're down and dirty, they give us some information that maybe we haven't really thought of, we don't know how to interpret them, but they're good for a reason, I think I've spoken on it before. But, because we were talking about some financing issues, somebody having some uh, transactional troubles, some, some difficulties, not everyone goes smoothly, depends on who you're working with and who's doing your listing, who's doing the buying. I have coming up, I'm pleased to announce this, I got a good uh, old friend, a good friend, I can't call him an old friend, he's younger than I am. I got a good friend, one of the hardest working guys in the business, in the mortgage origination business, Mr. Zach Jones of Lone Depot. We've had him on before and we're going to have him back because he's agreed to come back and talk about some, some of the loan issues, what's going on right now. Now, you know they're doing a ton of refis, a lot of people, uh, whether they were the percentage may not have made the percentage of interest may not have made a big di difference a lot of people during rona have refinanced to capture as much percentage of mortgage rate and in, uh, in, the interest rate down catch as much of that as they can but also some of them are doing it in combination with running out their term longer into the future refinancing into the future for a longer term to give them a little bit of uh, mortgage flexibility. So some of that's going on in affecting our market. We've got Rona that's affecting the cost of inputs. We've got a lot going on. And of course, you know, we got to do this thing that we got to do every week. Dell Delbridge, Benchmark Realty, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. If you're currently unrepresented and would like to know how to compare up to three properties side by side, room by room, then go over to my new YouTube channel. Subscribe while you're there. Watch the demo. Afterwards, get with me and we'll set up your exclusive account today. Now that we did that, I want to talk a little bit about these numbers and highest and best. Now, I happen to have an old film here I did. Let's watch it real quick. This is the story of how the customer pool varies. We will use an XY graph where the listing price is Y and the number of potential buyers is X. From low to high and few to many. At any point in time, the number of people who could buy if they wanted to can be represented by a line. This is only the ability to buy. Demand is another chart. If the price is low, there are many people who could afford to buy. But when the price is high, there are only a few people who have the ability to pay that high price. It is crucial to understand markets when listing a home. To discuss marketing your home, call Dell Delvers at Benchmark Realty, LLC, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, 615-809-2323. Voice at 615-409-SOLD-7653 or text or sell at 615-347-5664. Now what this film did was it explained in what a minute or two, I forget how long the film is, uh, but it just whatever length of time it was, it explained something that a lot of people understand if they stop thinking about it, they just may not understand it on the fly, they may not stop and think about it. There is a difference between a desire to buy and an ability to buy. I personally would desire to have a Lamborghini but I don't have a quarter of a million dollars to pay for it, so I have the desire to buy a Lamborghini, I just don't have the ability to buy the Lamborghini. And our homes are getting in the same way. Now right now, as you know, we've had uh, Rona and shutdown and everything is supply and demand. So we have a couple of things that, that that's doing for us. It's, it's helpful in one respect and it's hurting us in other respect and, and it doesn't do any good to qualify good for bad. It just is what it is. Now. In some states, as you know, Tennessee is getting a lot of growth. Some states are not doing it. Some states are actually going down in area. Memphis in Tennessee still going down in part. They're actually going down. But in Middle Tennessee, we're doing pretty good as a whole. I think I can say that without being too, uh, too uh, risky. We're doing pretty good in Middle Tennessee. But now states like Minnesota and California and New York and New Jersey, some of these places that are extremely high tax states and they have high income tax on top of that, they're paying federal taxes and sales taxes and income taxes and they're getting to be such a high burden on people that those with the ability are relocating. People, they're seeing net growth in the negative direction and we're seeing positive growth. 
So our market is different than others. I know I ran into a guy the other day just chatting and his real estate professional told him, well, hold on because you might be able to get a buy. Uh, a buy. Okay, you might get you a bargain. Well, maybe if you want to move to California or Minneapolis or some of these places that have the issues, taxes and violence, and, and you're locked in your home, Boston and these places, some of these places you might get a bargain. You might see prices drop. I did. A, I showed a story a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago or two. Uh, New York prices, rent prices are coming down, right? It's supply and demand. Supply and demand. In Tennessee, we have extremely high demand and very low supply. So that's going to run prices high. Now, if they stay this way, if we, if we can keep the demand high, the prices, the values will come up. But right now we might see strictly by the numbers, strictly by the numbers, the way the formulas work and, and where we've only got so much wiggle room in this, the price may be a little overpriced as a seller. And you say, that's great because I'm getting more for it than what it's worth. That's great for me. And then the buyer's thinking, well, you know, that doesn't sound great for me, but my mortgage rates are extremely low. So if I, I have to balance out my great mortgage rate, locking in and that certainty of locking in now on the strong personal belief that, you know, it's going to keep going up, they'll catch up. The problem is the ability to buy versus the desire to buy. We have a good match of desire to buy and availability well, those things are balancing out the problem is so many of these people the way the numbers work out on the appraisals they're already artificially high where they normally would be at a pace that they're at they may already be a little high but they're not high enough for a lot of buyers to pay the contract price that they agreed to Okay. simply because they don't have any cash. A lot of folks don't have any cash. They don't, they don't have a big pile of money they can go put their hands on. Now, what a highest and best offer is, let's, let's talk about something. I think I can do this without it being insulting. Say, let's call the best offer a, 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 the good to the best or bad to the best is being a, based upon the likelihood it's going to fall through. Okay. So if I have like one of these investors, a cash money investor, and he's way down here, he knows with that great certainty what he's willing to buy because he's setting the price. He's, he's not offering you, he's not asking you what you want to sell it for. He's walking in and say, this is what I'll give you for. And he has a pretty good idea if he's willing to make the offer what he's willing to give for it. So that's probably a pretty strong offer. And he does it for a living. So all he does is buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, maybe buy or repair. And everything. But that's what he does. So as the old expression goes, and this is where they kind of get a little ticky at me a little bit sometimes, I'll buy all the dollars you want for 80 cents a piece, okay? Because I know I can immediately turn right around and get me some money out of it. A per, when you sell in the marketplace to people, to real people, they're not buying it. Most of the time, they're not buying it for an investment. They're buying it for a home. They're buying it for other reasons other than investing. And so you're often able to get more money to an individual that you would if you're going to an investor, okay? because they're going to live there for a while. They're going to make leverage of the time value of money and the interest rates and the growth of the value over a period of years. And they're not necessarily buying it to make money. They're buying it because they love the home and they want to live there. So when you sell to people using an agent like, like me, you're probably going to get a better price. It may not be as certain, and that's kind of where we're got, we get into. These numbers, I look at these numbers specifically because Let's call this this cash buyer, this rich dude down here on the bottom, this 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 uh, buy and resell. He's buying your home for re for inventory, not for a living in. Let's call that a good, solid, one hundred percent guarantee, because he's guaranteed he's going to give it. Now, it may not be all the money you're going to get out, but he's guaranteed that's a pretty solid, straight up guarantee of sale. You might lose twenty cents on the dollar, ten cents on the dollar, fifty. I don't know, maybe two to just not putting a number on it, that's probably going to be pretty safe because he knows he has to have his ability to make it worth his while. Now you have an individual over here, a family that wants to buy a home or a person that wants to buy a home. They're in a different league. They're buying it because of a different set of motives. So that might be your highest. They might be willing to give you more money for the run, but they may not be able to make that. They may not be able to make that happen. So somewhere between these two is the highest and the best. So we kind of balance those out. Now, what's happening, and I'll just be straight up honest with you, it's regulated. This industry is highly regulated, 
and everybody wants to make the transaction happen. Nobody makes money if the transaction doesn't happen. The seller, I put that price up here. We, we can sell it all day long, but if nobody buys it, that price up here is worth nothing. I mean, it, you, you've lost 100% of you. Yeah, but I have a high percentage. Did you sell it? No, then you didn't get anything. Well, if I put it down here, I'll lose money. Did you sell it? No, then you didn't lose anything. It's where you actually sell that home that drives everything. So what happens is people are getting, you might find, let's say, it's just a possibility that there are people out here who've been looking at houses and they're getting frustrated because they keep losing the contract to someone who overbid them. And so they want to do, they want to bid higher. And that just pushes that price higher. Okay, two things are happening here. And the first is there's one way that people are trying this thing out. They're doing what's called an escalation clause. And I don't do escalation clauses if I can help it. I don't know that they're legal. When we do a contract, it has to be date certain, and I believe it also has to be price certain, and I'm not an attorney. So how if I write you a contract that says, because you instructed me to do so, and that says, go ahead and do this, offer them $1,000 over the highest offer they received, well, that's a little bit like cheating on one thing, but I also can't tell you what price you're actually bidding, can I? Because I don't know what the highest is going to be. So I don't know that that's actually illegal. And some lawyers will say yes, some lawyers will say no. But now what happens if you get two of them? Okay, right? You got two people saying they'll give you a thousand over, thousand over the highest, and you're going back and forth. Who gets to be? Is it who happens to be the first one by date? Do you do it by the first one that your hands touch when you open when you looked at the, the computer that day? It just gets unnecessarily vague and I don't like to do them. I don't like, I would rather my my seller not do one. I want to tell them, give me your best price the first time you come through. Make it a good one, make it real, and we'll go from there. And the chips fall where they may. But, uh, you know, if you've been around a while, you might find some people are, are getting frustrated and they say, well, look, if we don't get the bid, we never have to worry about paying for it. Let's go ahead and get the bid. Let's get the contract and we'll worry about paying for it later. The problem to the seller is, don't care what this price is, if I can't sell at that, I want to find the highest price I can get that I can get the transaction to go at. That's what they're going for. So we're com maybe coming down. And then the person trying to buy it, they're just trying to get their name on the list, okay? So if you have someone who if they suggest to you that you pay more than you're willing to give, I think that that is certainly unethical, is immoral, and it may be illegal. So that's just the way I look at it. If you give an offer on a contract, you better be willing to make good on it. And you can't say, well, yeah, but we can do the financial contingency box, Dell. And if I can't get a loan, I can't get a loan. I just get out of it that way. That's just not, that's not, no, that's not a good deal. I would advise against that. But some people are giving them kind of a, well, get, the, get it, we'll deal with it after we get the, we get the contract. And there's some, ten, there's some, there's some natural human nature leads you to do this. But part of this number goes is if you're a, if you're capable, what a strong buyer is. If I have an FHA buyer that may even need some uh, THDA uh, down payment assistant and they're willing to give five ten thousand dollars more than this other person out here who's a not a cash buyer but say they're a conventional loan and they can put down 20 25 percent they have some flexibility this may actually be to, to the seller the best the highest and best offer because there's some low risk it's, it's maybe above a straight up cash but, and it may be less than somebody who's got to go 100% and they're doing everything they can to, to get there. But highest and best are not necessarily the same thing. What I believe we'll see when I look at these numbers on that one ratio, I look at the under contract still showing. I interpret a strong influencer of this is as people are taking these high prices on the sale of the houses and then they're running into some troubles. They can't, they can't make it happen and they're starting to fall through. So what are they doing? They keep selling that house. It's, it's under contract. It's not really available for you to buy until the contract fails, but they're showing it because they're getting ready. They're anticipating that failure. 
And if you're looking to list a house, I can educate you on that. We can do that. But it's very frustrating to a lot of people. And it's just simply because your home is going to be worth what somebody has the ability to pay. And someone has the ability to pay if they're having to mortgage all of it is less than somebody who has some cash money. So if you happen to be an individual, like when I, part of that letter, when I give somebody that pre-approval letter, if that pre-approval letter says they're good for a conventional loan, 80-20, however it's written, and I can even if they ask me about it, if we have some discussion, that's a good strong offer. It's a better offer, even if it's a few thousand dollars less, some might feel that it's a better offer, even if it's not the highest, because taken together, highest and best, it works out. So sometimes trying to focus on that top number so much messes everyone up. Let's look at the previous week's numbers and today's. Last week active in the system, 6044, decreasing over the previous week, under contract still showing, 4410, decreasing over the previous week, a ratio at 73%. This week, active in the system, 6022, further reduction in inventory, under contract still showing, 4401, that ratio at 73%. I interpret maintaining a high ratio of the under contract still showing being because some of these prices are falling through at that amount. The, the appraisal combined with the amount of cash on hand to make the transaction work is a little bit low for so many people that the financial contingency, if it's checked, is being taken to exit that contract. An alternative to exiting when you can't get financing is a tendency, if it's close, to try to negotiate the seller down to one of those lower prices where it will go through, either by negotiation straight out on price or looking at repair cost, hoping that that will negotiate that price back down. My feeling is it's a best practice to bid on a house, to put a contract on a house for what you're willing to pay and able to pay. I would not suggest it's the best practice to try to just win the contract and then to try to negotiate that price down if you fail the contingency. That puts people in a bind. But a good number of people are still under contract and showing for whatever reason they might have, perhaps ready to take someone else's contract. So bid what you need to, bid what you want, be prepared to pay what you bid for a home. That's some of the stuff you may expect to see. If you're selling, it's a great time to sell. Prices are high. If you're buying, it's a great time to buy because interest rates are extremely low and it looks like people are going to continue to love Middle Tennessee the way we do and we're going to have a high demand on our products and we can find a nice, beautiful home. It's almost going to be Thanksgiving. Can't you imagine having the whole uh, the family in that brand new house that still smells like fresh paint? So you know what you got to do. You got to call Dell to sell and check me out on the YouTube. But call Dell, 1L and Dell, no spaces, where you find this at. Subscribe so you get the, the uh, notification when they come up. And look for my friend Zach, Zach Jones of Lone Depot because we're going to be talking about some stuff. So appreciate you watching. Sorry this ran long. I'm sure it did.